Hello, fictional. Welcome to the crossover what ifs. Today we are gonna see, what if Naruto got harem with Katara, as a land off. Huge shout out to King Devil Bringer for this story. If you end up liking this video, please consider subscribe, so without further ado, let's get into the video. Staring at the open sea, a nine-year-old Naruto couldn't help but grin and breathe in the fresh air. He loved days like this, a bright sun shining down through a clear sky, and enough wind to keep you cool without being too much. There was no way to describe a day like this other than perfect. There was absolutely nothing that could ruin it. Naruto Uzumaki. You get your ass down here right this instant. Well, almost anything. Sighing, Naruto looked down from the top of the ship he was on to see his mother glaring up at him from the ship's main deck. Without uttering a word, he began to climb down from the side of the ship. Passing the bridge window, Naruto gave a loud laugh as the ship captain and his sailors all gawked at him, staring with wide eyes and slack jaws from seeing a small child climbing the side of the Fire Nation ship. He had always loved climbing. It could be trees or buildings, or ships like this, he would climb it and have fun doing it. He didn't know if it was the sense of adrenaline or just the challenge of it, either way, he loved it and climbed anything tall every chance he got. However, this was also the reason his mother was shouting at him. How many times have I asked you not to climb things? His mother, Kishina, demanded to know as soon as his foot touched the main deck. She was a beautiful woman with long red hair and dark blue eyes. She wore a pale red dress with a black top, which ended at her ankles to show her black shoes. Don't remember, he answered honestly, raising his hands to rest on the back of his head. I lost count a while ago. The wind picked up a little, ruffling his spiky blonde hair, but he made no move to stop it. His bright blue eyes looked at his mother's with a mischief clearly showing in them. He wore a pair of dark red shorts and a black sleeveless shirt. Too many. Kashina shouted, grabbing her son by the ear and pulled hard. She didn't care that the other passengers were staring and watching. And I asked you not to climb this ship specifically. Thanks to how she was pulling on his ear, Naruto's feet were not even on the ground anymore as he struggled against her mother's grip. Ow. Let go of me, you crazy woman. He shouted, his little legs kicking in the air. I am not crazy. His mother shouted in a slightly deranged way. Knowing he had had enough, she let go and dropped her son, who was now rubbing his sore ear and glaring at her. Where are your shoes? She then asked, noticing the lack of footwear on Naruto's feet. Looking down, Naruto stared at his feet for a few seconds before having the audacity to look her in the eyes and pointing to the top of the ship. Must have left them up there, he answered, with a cheeky grin. I can go get them if you want. No. Just leave them, Kashina interrupted with a sigh. They were expensive as well. She thought, tears in her eyes. Usually she wouldn't purchase anything too expensive, but she just loved those shoes the second she saw them and wanted her son to wear them. That was only three hours ago, and it cost her several silver pieces. Walking over to the side of the ship, Naruto managed to tiptoe himself up to peer over the railing and look out towards the water again. Where are we going again? He asked, not seeing anything but water. Going over to the railing as well, Kishina took a moment to pick up Naruto and have him sit on the railing before she too leaned on it. I told you already, it's called Ember Island, she answered with a sigh, having told him three times now. It's a resort island where the citizens of the Fire Nation go to relax. Everyone here is probably on vacation. Looking back to everyone else on the ship, Naruto noticed that almost everyone looked excited and they all had bags and cases with them. He also noticed that, besides the sailors that worked on the ship, nearly everyone was dressed in fancy clothing. Suddenly, Kishina spotted something in the distance and grinned, there it is. Turning back around, Naruto strained his eyes and just managed to see something in the distance that was slowly growing in size as the ship sailed closer. The closer they got to the island, Naruto couldn't help but agree with the island's name. The sun was starting to set, so it bathed the whole island in shades of red and orange, making it look as if the beaches and the mountain were on fire. There were many ways to describe the Fire Nation. Evil, bigoted, and vile were just some of those words. But right now at this very moment, Naruto couldn't think of any other word than beautiful. Wow, he muttered with wide eyes, having not expected this. Yeah, I had that same look when I first saw this place as well, Kashina laughed, seeing her son's reaction. Did dad bring you here? Naruto asked, but when he didn't hear a reply, he looked at his mother and stopped when he saw her with a sad look. He should have expected that, it always happens whenever he mentioned his father. Sorry, Naruto muttered, knowing Hiro and his mother's happy mood. Shaking her head, Kishina gave Naruto a smile. It was a strained smile, only just managed to hide how she felt, but she held strong. It's alright. Yes, your father brought me here for the first time around 20 years ago. Every year, we came back and spent a wonderful week together until... Until he died Naruto thought with a frown as his mother trailed off with a distant look in her eyes. He barely remembered his father, hell he didn't even know his name as the man died when he was four. 
He didn't even know how he died either and could never bring himself to ask. His mother refused to tell him anything and, because of what happened, he and his mother have been traveling around from place to place, never staying for more than a week or two. That brought him to their current situation. A week ago, they were in a small village of Gaipan, which was in the Western Earth Kingdom, and had barely been there for a single day, before Kashina received a message from a messenger hawk. How it found them, Naruto would never know. After reading the message, Kashina was shocked and she then forced Naruto to drop whatever it was he was doing before the two packed up and left for the Fire Nation. The entire trip, his mother refused to tell him why they up and left Gaipan so suddenly, she just kept saying she had some unfinished business and to stop asking. Now here they were, on the docks of Ember Island. Kashina led Naruto by the hand, weaving through the crowd to avoid the officials checking documents and tickets. They weren't exactly here legally, as they had neither documents or tickets. They both wore a dark cloak, mostly to hide their hair as it made them stand out. Both also had on backpacks, and Kashina was also holding a long item wrapped in a black cloth. Betting past the guards and officials were easy, and it didn't take long before Naruto was standing on the sandy beach of Ember Island. Due to the constant sunshine, the sand was almost hot to the touch, but Naruto found it pleasant as the warm sand covered his feet and toes. Yep. I am so living here when I'm old enough. Naruto decided, loving the idea of living by the beach. Of course he was only 9 years old, so he had no idea how much houses on the beach would cost, especially on an incredibly popular place such as Ember Island. The house we're going to isn't far, Kashina said, taking hold of Naruto's hand to lead him. Once we're settled, I might consider letting you explore as long as I can see you. Hearing this, Naruto grinned and began pulling his mother in the direction she was originally leading them to, wanting to speed things along. Somehow, along the way, Kashina began to lead again and took them to a secluded part of the beach that was almost hidden. Are we there yet? Naruto began to ask, excited to see where they would be staying. If you ask me that one more time, I'll lock you in a chest and make sure you can't get out while I'm gone, Kashina threatened, which made Naruto stop his next repeating question. And yes, we are here, she then answered, as the house she and her husband used to come to when they visited. Looking, Naruto could only admire it as, just like everything else here on the island, the house was incredible. While it wasn't as big as the others, it was still intricate in its design with the wooden walls having many carvings. As soon as he was inside, the first thing that Naruto did was dive for the couch. This is so comfy. He laughed, bouncing a little on it. Ashina laughed with him, putting down their packs and belongings as she took a seat, taking a moment to relax. Nothing's really changed, she said, mostly to herself. The softness was the exact same. Even the wooden grain of the floorboard felt the exact same against her feet, having taken her shoes off at the door. While she had important business that she wanted to take care of, it wouldn't hurt to relax for one night. Funnily enough, Naruto completely forgot about the beaches outside as he enjoyed himself indoors. The night was filled with laughter and fun as Kashina made them both a lovely dinner, and then they played some games before going to bed. Now, usually they would go to some hotel or sleep in a tent, so the beds they usually sleep in were rough. But the beds in this house were so soft that Naruto fell asleep the second he laid down. Standing in the doorway, Kashina smiled warmly at her softly snoring son, who was sprawled out on his bed in an awkward position. It hurt her just being in this house, too many memories, but Naruto always helped her forget her pain. Quietly closing the door, she made her way to her room and stopped at a small picture frame next to the bed. Sitting down, she carefully took hold of it. If only you were here, Kashina whispered, her hand resting over her heart with closed eyes, Minato you would be proud of our Naruto. He is such strong little boy, and it's like he isn't afraid of anything, just like you were. Some tears fell, but she ignored them as she kept talking, he does have his moments though, always getting into trouble. I think he gets that from me. Bringing the picture up, she gave it a small kiss and whispered, I miss you. Waking up the next morning, Naruto gave a big yawn and rubbed his eyes. He couldn't remember the last time he had slept so well. The window was open, letting the morning air and light into the room. Getting out of bed, Naruto went through his morning routine of getting washed and dressed for the day before leaving his bedroom. Mom? He called out, wondering where she was. I'm in the kitchen. He heard her voice from deeper in the house. Remembering where the kitchen was, Naruto walked there and found his mother just finished making breakfast for the two of them. Just rice for breakfast. Need to pick up some food when we go out today. Sounds good, Naruto said. I'm okay with rice, still tastes better than all that green stuff you make me eat. Rolling her eyes, Kashina sat down with Naruto at the table and pointed her chopsticks at him, those green things are vegetables, and they're good for you. Now eat. Once we're finished, I'll show you around the island. As always, whenever the two ate together, they would always end up arguing playfully. 
that started when Kashina told Naruto to eat his food more slowly unless he wanted to choke, Naruto's reply was for his mother to mind her own business. That earned him a swift slap to the back of his head for being rude. Once they had cleaned up, they left the house. Kashina was happy to show an excited Naruto around the island. They stopped by several shops, took a look at the Ember Island Theater, and then played at one of many the beaches for the rest of the day. Do you have to leave tonight? Naruto asked as they walked home, a small frown on his face. They had a lot of fun for once, and he was hoping to have more tomorrow. I'm sorry, Kashina apologized to her son. But I have to. But why? He asked, not understanding. Because Kashina trailed off, unsure what to tell Naruto. The message I got is from an old friend, someone I thought was dead and he was a good friend to your father and I. His name is SHM, she answered after a minute. And you're staying here because where I'm going is no place for a child. Most people would find it odd why a mother would leave her nine-year-old son alone in a place he's barely been in for a day, but Kashina trusted Naruto. She would only be gone for a few days, a week at most, and Naruto knew how to take care of himself. She made sure to teach him how to look after himself, which includes cooking and some self-defense. Besides, she'll only be gone for a few days, a week at most, what was the worst that could happen while she was gone? I don't like it, Naruto muttered, crossing his arms with a pout. I want to go with you. Maybe when you're older or at least when you've actually grown an inch, Kashina said with a laugh. Naruto's height had always been a sore subject for him. He was always the shortest child. He never believed anyone when they told him he's due a growth spurt soon. Now let's head home. We've spent the whole day having fun, and I was planning on making ramen for dinner. Yay. Naruto cheered, his hands raised in the air as he ran around in joy. Raymond was the best food in the world to the boy, and when his mother made it, they were even better. Raymond. Raymond. Because he knew what was for dinner, Naruto rushed home in excitement. By the time Kashina caught up, she was laughing as she found him at the kitchen table with a knife and fork in hand. A whole pot of Raymond was made, enough to feed a large family. But, between Kashina and Naruto, they ate it all with ease. Actually it was more like two ravenous animals feasting on scraps of food after not being fed for more than a week. It was terrifying and disgusting, while also somehow being an incredible sight to see. Now Naruto was sat on the couch, patting his bloated stomach with a content sigh. There was nothing better than finishing an already incredible day with Raymond. Mum? He called out, realizing she wasn't in the room. But then he realized where she might be at this time of night. Quickly, he stood from the couch and made his way to the door and stepped outside. There, standing with water up to her ankles, stood his mother. She looked beautiful, standing in the perfect spot as the moon shined down onto her. Her back was to Naruto, but he knew her eyes were closed and that she was taking deep breaths. Knowing what was going to happen, Naruto sat down and watched carefully. Taking a stance, Kashina raised her hands and let them rest on the katana that was tied to her waist. It was the object she had brought on the ship, now unwrapped from its black cloth to show a dark red sheath and a handle wrapped in a black cord. The guard itself was golden and circular, a spiral etched perfectly in the metal. With practiced ease, Kashina unsheathed the sword, letting the sharp blade glint in the moonlight before holding it above her head. Slowly, she went through a series of movements, slashing and slicing the air, attacking the invisible enemies she imagined. That was also when Naruto noticed something else. The water that she was stood in, it began to move with her, following her movements. With every slice, the water shot forward. With every spin, the water circled around her. It looked like a dance to Naruto, one that he wished he could do but knew he could not. His mother was a waterbender, a person that could command and control water, but he was not one and could only watch in fascination. He'd be lying if he said he wasn't jealous. Kashina finished her practicing with a final slash, making the water fly forward towards a boulder nearby. It sliced into it, splitting it into two with a crash. The final flourish and Kashina sheathed her sword with a slight click and released a small breath she had been holding. Good, she muttered to herself, happy to see her abilities haven't rusted during her time on the run. Seeing her son nearby, she smiled, enjoy the show. It was incredible. Naruto exclaimed happily. You look so cool. Haha. Damn right I did. Kashina laughed. There's no way anyone's gonna take me on in a fight. She walked back into the house and into her bedroom, placing her sword on the bed before rewrapping it back in cloth. She then grabbed several things and packed them in a bag. Naruto helped her with her bag to the door, and he did so with a frown. Don't be sad, Kashina said, noticing his look. I still don't want you to go, Naruto pouted. Crouching, Kashina brought him into a hug and held him right. I know you don't and I wish I didn't have to either. But this is something I have to do, she said, I promise to get back here as fast as I can so don't worry, okay? Letting go of his mother, Naruto nodded, okay. And don't get into any trouble, do you understand? Kashina said sternly, I know you like to pull pranks and climb buildings, but please don't. 
I won't be here to get you out of trouble like last time. That was a year ago. And nothing really happened. It was six months ago and you glued a small platoon of Fire Nation soldiers' helmets to their heads, Kashina said dryly, they knew it was you immediately cause you couldn't stop laughing, and they chased you around the village we were staying in. Crossing his arms, Naruto gave another pout, it won't happen again. It was cute to see your son pout like that. I know it won't. Just stay safe, okay? I love you, she said, giving Naruto another hug. Returning the hug, Naruto said, I love you too, mum. And you stay safe too, please. Finished with their goodbyes, Naruto stayed at the door and watched his mother walk down the beach towards the pier. He gave her one last wave before heading inside. Where are you? Kashina muttered to herself. She was at the pier, looking for someone she had never met before. While looking around the stores with Naruto earlier, she had talked to random people. One of them mentioned that there was a certain ship at the docks, and that, for the right amount of money, they would deliver whatever cargo to wherever. There were only a few ships docked, but one of them stood out. While two of the ships were Fire Nation and made of metal, the third was a smaller wooden ship with red sails. Excuse me, Kashina said, walking up to a man who was telling others what to do. Are you the captain? What if I am? The man replied rudely, eyeing the woman up and down. I was told that you deliver special cargo for a price. Kashina continued, easily ignoring who the men looked at her. She had dealt with much worse before. And if they tried to lay a finger on her, then they'd lose that finger and probably other appendages. Always happy to make extra coin, the captain gave Kashina his full attention. That depends on what the cargo is and where it's going. Depending on where you want it to go, it can be expensive. I am the cargo, Kashina said, looking the man in the eyes to show her seriousness, and I need you to take me to the boiling rock. My friend, I hope this message reaches you. When I heard tale of a woman with hair as red as rubies traveling around the countries, I dared to hope that it was you. Which is why I sent my personal messenger Hawk to find you, he has a knack for finding anyone anywhere. If there was anyone who could help me, I knew only you could. I was captured that night five years ago and thrown in a cell. For months I was starved and tortured. They hoped that my spirit would break so that I would reveal the locations of our bases, however I never gave in, even when threatened with execution. But they never gave me death, instead they put me in a dark prison and made sure I suffered every day, wishing for the death they would never grant me. The prison I am in is the Boiling Rock, a vile place with no hope of escape. I beg you to rescue me before I lose what little sense of sanity I have left. I beg you. Your faithful friend. SHM. Thanks to the aid of the lamp next to her, Kashina read and reread the letter as she stood on the bow of the ship. It had been nearly two hours since she had left Ember Island, and she was now in the middle of the open sea. The captain had proved himself a capable seafarer as he had his crew maneuver the ship away from patrols without being seen. I can't believe that SHM's still alive, Kashina muttered, disbelief clear in her voice. Hearing someone walking up to her, Kashina quickly put away the note and turned to see the captain standing about a meter away, idly smoking a pipe. Can I help you, captain? She asked. The man was wearing a long blue captain's coat, which he wasn't wearing before. No doubt to try and make himself look more important. Please, you may call me H. I. Dao, instead of captain. He held a kind smile, but Kashina didn't like how he looked at her. I am just curious why a woman such as yourself would want to go to the boiling rock of all places, he said, nodding his head south, the direction of the prison. Anyone that even heard of that place would want to avoid it. But you want to go straight there. He leaned a little towards Kashina and blew some smoke with a grin, why? Waving her hand to get rid of some of the smoke, Kashina narrowed her eyes. I'm paying you to get me there, not to ask questions, she said, standing her ground. But that made the captain more amused than anything. How long until reach the island? I'd say tomorrow night, H. I. Dao answered, that is, if the water's allowed. With how rough they are now, there's a good chance it will make reaching the island a more difficult task than finding the avatar. The water doesn't concern me, Kashina countered, turning back to look out towards the sea. Just make sure we stay away from the island's docks. I don't want to be seen and neither do you. Unless you want thrown into the prison you'll be trespassing into. The captain didn't seem offended by Kashina's threat, he was more amused than anything. Then tell your men to stop leering at me, Kashina continued, glaring at the other crewmen who openly stared at her. If they don't stop then I'll cut off their manhoods and feed it to the iguana seals. And I assume you'll be using that interesting blade of yours, he said, glancing at the katana sword tied to Kashina's side. Seeing the woman grip the hilt of her sword, the man laughed and took a step back. Now, now, no need to be like that. I'm not going to do anything. He would have continued talking, but one of his men came up to them. Captain H. Idao, one of the naval ships is drawing closer. We should move before they see us. Forgive me, H. Idao said to Kashina, bowing his head a little, I must see to this. 
But please feel free to join us later so that we can continue our conversation. Kashina didn't say anything, and the two men left towards the ship's steering wheel. Now alone again, she relaxed but kept a hand on her sword just in case. She didn't trust anyone on this ship, and the captain just made that feeling worse. She didn't get any sleep that night in case the men on the ship tried anything, but they didn't try anything, thankfully. Kashina was also thankful that H. Idao stayed away from her. While eating some food that she brought with her, Kashina began to think of a plan on how to get into the boiling rock. She had no idea what it looked like, or how big it was, or even where SHM was. This was not going to be easy, not that she expected it to be. From what little rumors she had heard about the prison, she knew that the prison sat in the middle of a volcanic lake, and the only way to get into the prison was by gondola. Even with the water at a high temperature, Kashina knew she'd be fine with her waterbending. She just had to make sure to keep moving when she crossed the lake. There was also a good chance that security will be a bit more lax than other prisons, with how impossible it is to escape, meaning she should be able to move around inside with some ease. I'll have to improvise when I'm inside Kashina thought with a sigh, hating that she was going in without a plan. May I have a moment of your time? Kashina didn't even need to turn to see who had spoke to her. It was Captain H. Idao, or as Kashina has been calling him in her head, Captain Creep. As much as she'd like to say she'd rather be alone, the woman instead nodded. Is there something you need? She asked. Yes, you see, I have been going over our agreement, and then I realized something, he said, blowing some smoke from his pipe. Kashina narrowed her eyes but let him continue, well you have paid enough to be transported to the boiling rock, I'm afraid you need to pay extra to return from there. Excuse me? I paid you more than enough for this, she argued, you told me yourself that the payment was sufficient. Again, H. Idao held his smile, and it was annoying Kashina to no end. At the time, yes it was. But I didn't take into account the danger that myself and my crew would be in. Just by sailing near the island, we could be imprisoned for the rest of our lives. Now, I can promise to get you to that island, but I cannot promise my ship will be there to get you out. Snarling, Kashina was about to draw her blade, but stopped as she knew it wouldn't be a good idea. She was hating this bastard more and more, but she still needed him for now. Fine but I don't have any money on me right now. You have your sword though, that would do well towards paying off the rest, the captain suggested with a wicked grin, his greed now showing. That blade of yours is incredibly rare in this day and age. It would fetch a very good price to the right buyer. Now Kashina really did draw her blade and pressed it against H. Idao's neck. I would rather shatter my own sword than give it to you. She threatened. The crew saw what was happening and brandished their own weapons as they ran over to help their captain. But the man waved at them to calm down and not to interfere. I know you won't hurt me, he said, doing his best to ignore how the sword was starting to cut into his neck with how hard Kashina was pushing it, let's say you do kill me, you'd then be forced to fight my men and if they die, then who will pilot the ship? I highly doubt you can use my ship all by yourself. So, either pay up or you're on your own from here on. Kashina knew he was right. Even with her waterbending, she wouldn't be able to maneuver the ship well enough to avoid the patrols. With a scowl, she reluctantly let go of the captain and sheathed her sword. Snatching it from her waist, she thrust it into the captain's stomach, making him give an oomph as he caught the weapon. If you don't hold your end of the bargain, I'll take my sword back from your corpse. And I believe you, H. Idao said, happy to now have such a rare and valuable blade in his possession, but you have nothing to worry about. I am a man of my word, after all. No the funk you're not, Kashina muttered before pushing her way past the man to go be alone, otherwise she was going to kill someone. She walked past the crew who all moved to avoid her, just in case. For the rest of the day, Kashina was left alone which is what she wanted. It gave her time to prepare and make up some kind of plan. Now dressed black clothing to help her blend in with the darkness, she stood at the bow of the ship and waited as they neared the island. Even from where they were, they could all feel the heat radiating from the volcanic lake. Keep her steady. The captain ordered from the wheel, guiding the ship closer. As soon as she could, Kashina jumped from the ship and landed on the ground in a perfect roll. She stayed there for a few seconds to make sure she wasn't seen before standing. We'll be here in a few hours, H. Idao said to the woman as the ship began moving away, that should give you plenty of time to do what you need to do. Kashina didn't answer him and, instead, turned and ran up the rocky hill. Once she reached the summit, she carefully looked over the edge and frowned. The lake was bigger than she thought it would be, and she could barely see the prison sitting in the middle due to all the steam. At least it will keep her hidden from the guards watching for potential intruders, not that they would be expecting any. Carefully, she climbed down towards the scolding water. Slowly, she bent the water and turned a bit of it to ice, only to frown as she watched it melt within seconds. Gonna have to be quick, Kashina muttered as she took a few steps back. Breaking into a sprint, she neared the water and froze it as she stepped on it. 
Every step she made, she also made a patch of ice to step on and jump off before it melted. It took her about 5 minutes of hopping on bits of ice before she reached the patch of land that the prison sat on. The steam from the boiling lake helping to mask her presence. Bedding closer to the prison, Kashina frowned as she examined the high wall. It must be nearly five stories high, probably more, and the walls were perfectly flat and made of metal, meaning it was next to impossible to climb without the proper equipment. Then again, for someone like her, getting over this wall and into the prison would be easy. No need to use the two water skins she had brought with her when she raised her arms, bringing a large amount of boiling water to her from the lake. She cooled it down quickly, creating more steam for cover, as the water gathered at her feet and lifted her into the air. Up above, two guards were standing on top of the wall, which was called the parapet. Both were there to watch for intruders, but neither were really paying any attention. For all their time working there, they had never seen anyone even attempt to break in prison. Sure, there had been numerous inmates try to break out, but they were never successful. But almost every day was boring as nothing happened. Guard number one was sitting on the ground half asleep as his co-worker, GUARD number two, leaned on the small wall overlooking the edge. Hmm? Guard number two hummed as a small noise caught his attention. What was that? He asked out loud as he looked around, not knowing what he was hearing or where it was coming from. It sounded almost like running water from a river, which didn't make any sense to the man. Thinking it was coming from below, he looked over the edge and would have gasped if it wasn't for the water that encased his head. Keep it down, guard number one said with a yawn as guard number two made some noise before grunting and falling silent. Opening his eyes, guard number one looked confused as he couldn't see the other guard nearby. What the hell? He muttered as he stood up, where did he go? There was a small noise behind him so he turned and stopped in shock as he saw a person wearing all black was standing there. He didn't even have time to shout as the person moved forward and slashed his throat with a the knife they held. Guard number one clutched at his throat in vain as blood poured out of his wound. Argling, he was helpless as the person pushed him over the edge and he fell to his death, following the other guard who had been pulled over. Making sure no one saw or heard what happened, Kashina made her way into the prison. She had no idea where she was going exactly, having never been here before or ever seeing any sort of plan for this place. Not only that but she was on a time limit, so she needed to hurry and find SHM, wherever he was. Once inside, Kashina found a spot where she was perfectly hidden and watched the guards walk by. From what she could tell, the guards stayed in groups of two and changed places every ten minutes. She also quickly learned that she was in the east wing, where all the guards lived while working here. The prisoner cells were mostly in the west wing, which was on the other side. Making her way through the prison, Kashina was careful as she avoided the random patrol by sticking to the darker areas and hiding whenever she could. Coming up to a corner, she stopped when she heard someone approaching. There was a door right next to her, and she had no idea what was behind it. Taking the risk, she found that it opened and ran inside a thankfully empty room, just as the person appeared. However, the guard just saw the door open and, knowing there shouldn't be anyone here, became suspicious and went to check. As soon as the guard entered the room, she felt a knife at their throat and was slammed against a wall. No sudden moves, Kashina hissed quietly, do anything and you're dead. Not if you understand. The guard nodded slowly, her body shaking in fear at potentially dying in a second. I'm looking for a prisoner and you're going to tell me exactly who I'm looking for. We've got a lot of them here, the guard replied nervously. He would have been put here nearly five years ago, Kashina continued, a little shorter than others. Brown eyes and hair, which was in a bun last I saw. Goes by the name SHM. The woman looked surprised from behind her mask, wait. I know him. He keeps to himself mostly, never causes any trouble. Kashina slammed the woman's head into the wall, jarring her. Tell me where I can find him now. Cell number 254, the woman gasped in pain, a ringing in her ears now. All the prisoners are in their cells at this hour. Perfect, now she knew the exact door she needed. All she had to do was find it. Thank you, Kashina said before killing the guard with a quick throat slash. There was no doubt that she would have either attacked if let go or went to sound the alarm, which was the last thing she needed right now. Letting the body drop to the floor, Kashina ignored the dead woman and left, making sure to shut the door so no one would think to check it. Finding the cell block was simple enough, the only real problem was that there were more guards here than she thought there would be. Four were grouped together at the bottom of the only staircase she could see that lead up a floor, and she could see a few more walk down the rows of cells to check the prisoners. Some of them even banged on the cell doors just to wake up a few for no other reason than to have a quick laugh. There's no way I can get past without them all knowing. Even if I kill some of them, the others would notice before I could do anything Kashina thought with a frown, trying to come up with a plan. What she needed was a distraction to draw the guards away. Oh, that'll work she thought, seeing the cell door next to her. Being sure not to make a sound, she took out one of her two water skins that she brought along. 
Using her bending, she drew out the water from it and put it into the keyhole. She then froze the lock from the inside before kicking the door open. The second it opened, she quickly hid and waited for her plan to start. The four guards heard the noise and looked over to see what it was. To their shock, a cell door was wide open and the prisoner walked out, who also looked surprised at what was happening. Oi. Get back in your cell. One of the guards ordered as he and the others made their way over. The prisoner, seeing a chance to possibly escape, took that chance and made a run for it, forcing the guards to chase after her. The couple of the guards up above ran down to help, leaving Kashin alone with less guards to worry about. She ran out of her hiding place and up the stairs, being careful in case the guards that stayed behind saw her. Let's see thought Kashina, looking at a few of the cells, 166. Damn, need to go up one more. The stairs were on the opposite side, but there were no guards on this floor, so it was just a case of running all the way around the floor she was on until she reached them. This time, when she went upstairs, there were two guards passing each other, and one of them was heading her way. Before she could try and hide, the guards saw her. In true. The guard tried to yell but was stopped by a shard of ice stabbing through his foot and into the ground. He cried out in pain as the other guard heard the noise. Running forward, Kashina jumped and threw several more icicles before landing her foot on the first guard. With her momentum, she was able to kick him down to the ground, smashing his head into the floor. That either knocked him out or killed him, either way he was out of the way, so Kashina focused on the other guard who dodged her ice attack. The guard spun round and threw his foot out, sending a wave of fire at her. Kashina easily jumped over the attack and then ducked a fireball. Moving to the side to avoid another attack, Kashina used the wall to spring forward and then bent her water to wrap around the guard's throat. Quickly, she used her knife and stabbed him in the chest, killing him. Drawing back her water, Kashina then took a deep breath and looked at what cell she was standing at. Funnily enough, it said 254, so she was exactly where she wanted to be somehow. Destroying the lock like she did before, she made her way into the cell and saw someone hiding beneath the bed. Who's there? The man said, squinting at the light that shone in to see who broke in. SHM? Is that you? Kashina asked, unsure if it was her old friend or not. For a moment, the man said nothing before he slowly pulled himself out from under the bed with a look of disbelief. It can't be he said softly once he stood, now getting a good look at the person. Kashina took off her mask, letting SHM see her face as well as her red hair. It is, he muttered before walking over, Kashina. By the flames, it is you. There was only one person in all of the four nations that had red hair, so there was no doubt about it in his mind. He launched himself forward, wrapping his arms around Kashina and nearly knocking her off her feet. Oof. Kashina grunted, not expecting the man to embrace her all of a sudden. And she definitely didn't expect him to start crying onto her shoulder. Yep, you haven't changed at all, SHM. Which wasn't exactly true. While his personality seemed the same, he looked a little different from what she remembered, but it had been five years since they last saw each other. His hair was longer, down to his shoulders, stress making him look older than he probably was, and he had a bit of a gut going on, which was clearly shown thanks to the prisoner's clothing he was wearing. You came? He sniffled, you actually came. That must mean you got my letter. After prying the man off of her, Kashina answered, I got your letter a week ago. I still can't believe you're alive. How? There was a noise in the distance, and Kashina quickly remembered the situation. Never mind, she said, putting her mask back up, we need to leave before more guards show up. SHM gave the woman a helpful look. Leave. You know a way to get off this forsaken prison. You'll see later, right now we have to go, she replied while making sure the coast was clear. Now shut up and follow me quietly. Just like old times, SHM said before doing as he was told. Leaving the cell, they moved past the two dead guards, or one dead guard and one unconscious guard who might be in a coma due to severe head trauma and possible brain damage. Just as they got to the bottom of the stairs to the ground floor, alarms began blaring throughout the prison which alerted every guard to a breakout. Snapping her head to look at SHM, Kashina said, run. And stay close to me. Going back the same way she came in was probably not the best way to go, but it was the only way Kashina knew to get out quickest. Any other path might take too long and she couldn't risk it. A few guards appeared and tried to stop her, but she dealt with them quickly. Even SHM helped when he could by using his firebending to fight the guards and to protect Kashina. Running some more, the two eventually made their way along the parapet, but stopped as a dozen guards appeared from the other end. Looking back the way they came, Kashina saw that more guards also appeared, blocking both ways. The guards carefully approached and were ready to attack when ordered as Kashina and SHM backed up until their backs touched the wall. What do we do? SHM quietly asked, looking back and forth between the many guards surrounding them. This this. SHM repeated before shouting out as Kashina grabbed him and both fell over the wall. 
He screamed in fear as he saw the ground quickly approaching. Grabbing onto SHM, who would not stop screaming, Kashina opened both of her water skins and drew out the water. Acting quickly, she created a long whip of water to cover her free arm and managed to stab into the metal wall, stopping them from falling to their deaths. You can stop screaming now, Kashina said while using the water to lower them both safely to the ground. Realizing he was now safe, SHM opened his eyes after shutting them in fear. Oh, he muttered. Once his feet touched the ground, he collapsed while breathing heavily from all the adrenaline. You're just as crazy as you were all those years ago, he accused with a small laugh. I was never that bad, Kashina tried to defend while making sure no one followed after. It looked like they were safe for a few minutes, but they still had to get across the lake and off the island. I seem to recall you fighting an entire Earth Kingdom platoon, just because one of them compared your hair to a tomato, SHM said with a deadpan stare. Blushing, Kashina glared at SHM and shouted, that was one time. What about that time in Galing where you robbed? We all agreed to never speak of that night again. Kashina hissed, her glare finally shutting SHM up. Once he had managed to catch his breath, Kashina lead him to the lake's edge. This time, she created a raft made of ice and had SHM climb in, to which she followed suit. Quickly, before the ice melted, she used her waterbending to push and sail the raft quickly to the other side of the lake. The hard part was now over and Kashina relaxed a little. All that was left was to get off the island and onto H. Ida's ship, and judging by the fact that she could see the ship nearby, meant that it shouldn't take too long. Easy does it. Called out H. Ida as he sailed his ship away from the island. Kashina and her friend were now on board, soaked from swimming to them and climbing aboard. We need to get far away from here as fast as we can, men. There was a chorus of, I, I, Captain. As each crew member went about their jobs. Letting his first mate take the wheel, H. Idao walked over to Kashina with a grin. A successful trip, I see. You were lucky, he said, when I heard the alarms, I feared you wouldn't return. You wouldn't have cared either way, Kashina replied back heatedly. You already got paid and took my sword from me. Just hurry and take me back to Ember Island. We are already heading in that direction, the captain said with a laugh, uncaring of how the woman accused him of blackmail. They couldn't even hear the alarms anymore, showing that they have sailed far enough away now. As long as we are careful, we'll be there by this time tomorrow. He then walked away, to make sure his crew were doing things right. I need some sleep, Kashina groaned, rubbing the sleep out of her eyes. Looking at his friend, SHM raised an eyebrow, why don't you? You got me out of that prison and we're sailing to freedom. You can rest now. Waving her hand to the crew, Kashina showed that they were randomly staring at her with obvious lust. Because I can't trust any of these bastards. As soon as they see me sleeping, they'll try something. I'll watch over you, SHM offered, you get some sleep, and I'll make sure they don't do anything. Besides, I think you need it. You look like you're about to pass out. Kashina wanted to say no, to let her friend rest after gaining his freedom after five years of imprisonment. But her body felt heavy, and she felt tired after today's events and lack of sleep. It was starting to take a toll on her. Fine, she relented after a few minutes of internal debates. You win. You make sure they stay away from me. But if they try anything, I'm cutting off limbs. Fair enough, SHM said with a nod, having expected her to make random threats. With her own nod, Kashina practically collapsed onto the floor and shut her eyes, falling asleep soon after. SHM stayed with her for several minutes, making sure that she was fully asleep before moving away. Finding H. Ida back at the wheel, he walked up to the man and said, Captain, may I have a moment of your time? H. Ida took a puff from his pipe before nodding. You need something. Shaking his head, SHM continued, No I don't, thank you. I was just wondering something. H. Ida waved his hand, motioning for SHM to say what he wanted. I heard my friend mention how she already paid you, and you even acquired her sword somehow. I was just curious to know what happened. Your friend paid me a bag's worth of gold to take her to the boiling rock, H. Idao answered with a shrug. As I said to her, with how dangerous it was for my men and I to sail these waters, another bag of gold would make things more fair. Obviously she didn't have the coin on her, but she did have a very rare sword. With a chuckle, H. Idao blew some smoke, she was very reluctant to hand it over, but she relented in the end. That sword is now safely in my quarters. Interesting, SHM muttered. Why the interest? H. Idao asked back. Looking around to make sure no one was listening, SHM said, because I'm not sure you know who hired you. That caught H. Idao attention, I'm not sure I understand. Let me tell you something about Kashina, and then maybe you'll understand a little better, SHM said with a dark chuckle, a plan forming in his head to get what he wanted. I would like to wear my new dress tonight. Yes dear. Perhaps we can go to the Scorched Lantern tonight, I hear their hippo cow steaks are to die for. Anything you want, dear. Are you even listening to me? Of course, dear. 
For once in Vice Admiral Lee's life, he regretted marrying a woman who was more than half his age, him being 61, and she being 28. You would have thought he would learn as this was his third marriage in nine years, but apparently not. Of course there were some advantages to their age differences. She was young and beautiful while he was old and fat. It also helped that she was great in bed, more than happy to do all the work while he enjoyed himself. If there was one disadvantage, it would be that she talked a lot, almost insistently. He wouldn't have bothered with courting her if it wasn't for the fact she was from a rich family, much like his second wife had been. He wondered if he could just give her a child to focus on, that way she would talk to it rather than him. Actually, an even better idea would be to give her a child and then he himself be sent off on a ship to wherever. That way he wouldn't have to deal with them for a year, maybe two if he was lucky. Vice Admiral Lee was so lost in thought, he barely noticed his wife talking to him again. But what he did notice was that someone had just walked into him. He easily stayed standing while the person who had bumped into him fell to the ground. Now, if this was anyone else, Lee would have shouted and yelled at them to stay out of his way, but because it was a child, he instead knelt down and looked apologetic while his wife went away to look at a shop window. I'm sorry, boy, are you hurt? I I'm okay, sir, Naruto muttered as he took the man's offered hand which pulled him back onto his feet. I wasn't looking where I was going. Are you hurt? Lee asked, happy to see that the child shook his head no. Then be on your way, little one. Thanks, sir. Naruto cheerfully said as he ran away with a wave, Lee waving back with a smile. What a nice boy Vice Admiral Lee thought, happy to see a child of that age acting polite. Turning back, he spotted his young wife motioning for him to get to her. It was clear she sees something she would like for him to buy. All thoughts of the boy disappeared as Lee made his way to his wife. Yes dear, he sighed. Pointing at the window and towards a necklace, the wife happily smiled. I want that one. It will go beautifully with my new dress. Looking at the piece of jewelry, Lee had to admit that it was a nice. And the price tag next to it was even nicer. Very well, he said, but that would be all for today, do you understand? Seeing his wife nod with a pout, Lee reached back towards his money purse. His brow furrowed though when he felt nothing there. Trying the other side, he still felt nothing. Where is it? He questioned, turning around to see if he dropped it. Not seeing it anywhere, he looked confused until he realized that the boy that bumped into him missed, have snatched it. That boy is a thief. Ha ha ha. Naruto laughed as he tossed a small bag of coin into the air before catching it. It was always fun to steal, and people like that always fell for the clumsy child routine. At least this guy was nicer, the last person he did this to, he got kicked in the stomach. He still managed to steal the guy's money, but it hurt like hell. Now, let's see what I got. Opening the bag, Naruto smiled as he saw dozens of silver pieces and even more copper pieces. He half expected some gold pieces but could see none. Still a good score either way. His mother had taught him some pickpocketing skills while they were traveling around, and while she never really cared for it, she did see the usefulness as it helped them at times. The first thing Naruto bought for himself with his hard-earned money was a snack that was popular in the Fire Nation. It was called Hot Rocks. From what Naruto saw, it was made similarly to how bread was made, but you cook it just before it burns. Then you sweeten it however you like, with honey or sugar, and then you cook it some more until it hardens before serving as it's warm. Munching on the surprisingly tasty treat, Naruto had a look around some more just to see if there was anything that would catch his eye. There were a few trinkets and toys, but nothing he really wanted to buy. He knew his mother wouldn't want him to anyway, as they always kept their packs light for easier travel. No need for useless stuff that won't help in the long run. He found himself on top of a building's roof, sat on the edge that overlooked one of the many beaches. It gave him a nice view as he finished his snack. Before long, he reached into his clothes and pulled out a piece of paper. It was a letter his mother had left for him when she left two days ago. She had left it with a big pot of ramen that should have lasted a few days. Should have being the key words as Naruto ate all of it for breakfast. Anyway, looking back at the letter, he read it for what had to have been the umpteenth time. Dear Naruto. I know I apologized already for leaving you alone like this, but I am still sorry. Hopefully I'll be back within a few days, possibly a week at most, but no more than that. As you can see I have made you some ramen, and there should be enough to last a couple of meals, even for you. Please eat the fruit and vegetables I left with them. You are a growing boy, after all, and need your nutrients. Now, I am trusting you to look after yourself while I am gone. I know you are only 9 years old, but I trust you. You always were a bit smarter than other kids your age, so I'm sure you'll be okay. I would prefer if you stayed in the house the entire time I am gone, but I know you will not do that. If you do go out, then please be careful and remember everything I taught you. If I find out that you started another fight or pranked anyone, you will not be allowed any Raymond for a month. I love you, my little maelstrom. Please be safe while I'm gone. P.S. Don't you dare make a mess. 
I want that house to be clean by the time I get back. Naruto rolled his eyes at his mother's nickname for him. At least it was Little Maelstrom and not Little Raymond Topping, that one had a dozen people laughing when she called him that at a kid's park. He couldn't wait to get out of the village they had been staying in after that incident. Anyway, he folded the note and placed it back inside his clothing. Climbing back down, he decided to go for a walk along the beach just to pass the time. He walked past random people who were also out on walks and made sure to keep his distance. He did get a few funny looks, which he figured was either because he was a kid that was all on his own or because of his unique hair color. Either way he paid it no mind and kept walking. After several minutes of walking, he came across dozens of people who were playing around or just sitting in the sun. It was nice seeing so many people enjoying themselves without a care in the world. Seeing them all like this, it was actually a little difficult for Naruto to believe that these were the people that were waging war on the rest of the world. I wonder if that Fire Lord guy is here Naruto thought as he kept walking. If I defeat him, then I'd be the savior of the world. I can imagine mum's faces when she comes back, that'll be hilarious. He laughed out loud at his own thoughts, drawing strange looks from some passing strangers. So absorbed in his own thoughts, mostly of him picturing how he'd fight and beat the Fire Lord, Naruto wasn't paying any attention to where he was going. As a result, he walked right into someone. They both fell back and onto the ground, both groaning at what happened. Sorry about that, Naruto apologized, rubbing his head as he sat himself up. For once, he hadn't meant to do that. Watch where you're going. The person he bumped into shouted. Looking, Naruto saw that he had walked into a young girl who looked about his age. She was wearing a red summer dress with black and gold patterns on it. She had black hair which was styled to have a top knot, as well as two bangs framing her face. The girl was also giving Naruto a very harsh glare with her golden eyes. Boy. I said I was sorry. Naruto said back, not liking how rude the girl was to him even after he apologized. And we both walked into each other so we're both to blame. The girl looked shocked that someone had actually spoke back at her. No one had ever done this to her, and it quickly filled her with anger. Watch your tongue, boy. Or I'll have it cut out. Boy I'm older than you. You don't get to call me boy. What makes you think you're older? I'm taller than you. That makes me older. Naruto stopped shouting when the girl suddenly stepped up to him and held a hand on top of her head. Keeping it level, she moved it and showed that it was now an inch above Naruto's head, whose jaw dropped. What the hell? Now showing a smug smirk, the girl crossed her arms and took a step back, now who's taller, shorty? I might be short but at least I'm not ugly. How dare you? The two children kept throwing insults at each other, neither realizing that their shouting was drawing in a crowd that watched them. It was odd for them, seeing a young boy and girl yell at each other for no reason that they could see. A few of them managed to gather that it all started because one had walked into the other, which then somehow started all this. And now the two were just shouting names at each other. Shrimp. Loser. Idiot. Freak. The two just kept swapping insults, snarling at each other and nearly butting heads. But when Naruto shouted, monster. The girl reacted a little differently than he had expected. The girl went quiet for a few seconds before both of her hands erupted with large orange flames. With a roar, she lunged at Naruto who shouted in surprise before ducking, only just managing to avoid his head getting ripped off. What are you doing? Turning back to the boy that insulted her, the girl leveled a glare on Naruto, and he couldn't help but shiver in fear. I'm going to kill you, she said in a terrifyingly calm tone. Now hold still. Obviously not wanting to die, Naruto made a run for it with the girl hot on his trail. He ran past a number of stores as well as crowds of people, all of whom moved out of the way from the chaotic children. Thankfully, Naruto was able to keep ahead of the girl while running, but there were a few close calls, especially when she started throwing fireballs at him. It was a miracle they missed him as well as the random people and buildings, otherwise things would be a lot worse. Seeing a chance to make an escape, Naruto took it and made a sudden turn, running between two buildings. He rounded a corner and hugged the wall, panting as he took the chance to catch his breath. He was at a dead end but hoped his plan worked. Did I lose her? Naruto thought as he took a risky peek around the corner. She was there but she didn't exactly know where he was. Where are you? She roared, her hand still on fire. I know you're here somewhere. The girl was getting closer and Naruto was beginning to panic. He didn't want to die. He still had so much to live for. Like eating more of his mother's ramen, fighting in epic battles, eating more ramen, learning why 42 was the meaning of life, and then there was the ramen he had yet to eat. Calm down Naruto thought, hoping to come up with a plan to get out of his situation. There has to be a way out. Looking around more carefully, he took in his surroundings. Apart from the way he came in, he was surrounded by three wooden walls that were two stories high. Actually, now that he had a good look at one of the walls, he could see that some of the wood was broken off at random parts. Naruto grinned, knowing he could climb that. 
Hearing the girl's footsteps draw closer, he decided to just go for it and ran to the wall before scaling it as fast as he could. It wasn't as easy as he first though, mostly because some of the places to grab were more spaced out than he was used to. But he made it just in time, there you are. The girl shouted, just spotting him as he reached the roof. Get back down here. Sticking his tongue out, Naruto made a face at the girl. Make me. He taunted back with a cackle before shrieking as a fireball sailed past him. I'm going to roast you alive. The girl roared. Naruto just laughed at her threat again, thinking he was safe, but paled when he saw the girl somehow jump up to the roof, thanks to windowsills and walls. By the time she got up there, he had already began running away again. What's the matter? Scared. She shouted with a laugh while chasing after him. I might actually die. Naruto thought, unable to think of a way to get away from this crazy girl. The gap between buildings was about half a meter, so he could easily jump over to another roof, but so could the girl. Gotta think of a way out of this. He thought before noticing that he was running out of roof. He made it to the edge and saw that there was no place to go. He couldn't jump down as there was no safe place to land, and he didn't have the time to climb down, because as soon as he could try, the girl would catch up and burn him. Nowhere to run now, the girl said as she caught up. She had an evil-looking grin on her face, and her hands lit up with fire again. With every step she took, Naruto took one back until he reached the edge. Mercy. He pleaded. If anything, the girl's grin grew more villainous, and it was freaking Naruto out. I don't know the meaning of the word, she replied, the flames in her hands growing bigger. Shielding his face, Naruto shut his eyes as he waited for his inevitable demise. I'm sorry. He shouted, an apology being his last hope. He didn't want to apologize as it was the girl that had started all this, but he knew he should swallow his pride and just do it if it meant he could live. Apology accepted. Huh? Was Naruto's genius response as he opened his eyes to see the girl right in front of him. Her hands weren't covered in flames anymore, and she held a triumphant smirk. I was never going to hurt you, the girl admitted with a laugh, enjoying Naruto's bewildered look, as fun as it was, watching you run for your life, all I wanted was an apology. That was it. That was all she wanted. Naruto didn't know if he should be thankful or annoyed, so he decided on a mixture of both. You weren't going to hurt me. But what about those fireballs you threw? You almost took my head off. You dodged, didn't you? That's not the point. Rolling her eyes, the girl walked past Naruto to the edge of the roof. Spotting a pile of wooden crates just below the roof, with the edge hiding them from view, she easily jumped down. Naruto, seeing this, twitched as he wished he saw them before. Show off, he muttered before following. So, what was all that about then? You went crazy when I called you a monster. Crossing her arms as she leant on one of the crates, the girl glared at Naruto. I've been called that by too many people, including those that say they love me. I hate that name so you would do well to never call me that again. Judging by the scowl she wore and how tightly she was grabbing her own arm, Naruto could tell she was really bothered by the name he called her. Well I can think of other names to call you, but I don't think you'd like that, so what is your name? I'm Naruto. Basila, the girl said after a few moments. She had been tempted to not tell the boy her name, but thought there was no harm in indulging. Besides she was doing this for a reason. You're not from around here, are you? I think I would have seen you before now. That was mostly because of his hair. Azula had never seen a blonde before, and she doubted anyone else on the island has either. The two started walking in a random direction with no destination in mind. When Azula asked that question, Naruto thought of how to answer. He knew not to give too much information, as his mother had told him not to to help them stay safe. No, I'm not, Naruto eventually answered, my mother and I just got here a few days ago. We're not much for socializing so we really keep to ourselves. You're actually the first person I've had a proper conversation with since I got here. He then laughed, you're also the first person to attack me out of the blue like that. As you know, I had my reasons, Asla replied with a sharp look that Naruto wisely looked away from. There aren't many people that can outrun me, let alone a child, she commented, sounding a little impressed. Don't call me a child when you look about the same age as me, Naruto grumbled, not wanting to go back to who was older than who. He still wasn't happy with being shorter than the girl. Mum says I might as well be an airbender cause I'm light on my feet, always running around and climbing high places. Always been that way. Every time he reached a new height, his mother would always freak out which was hilarious to him. Although the ear pulling and the yelling when he gets back to ground level don't make it fun. God damn it. Kashina shouted as she and H. Idao's entire crew struggled to fight off two giant turtle squids, massive mollusks with armored skin and ten tentacles that were being used to grab hold of the ship. They were also grabbing some crew members and either throwing them into the distance or slamming them underwater. Kashina had been using her waterbending to fight back and hold onto the two creatures to limit their movement, but she had lost her concentration when she sneezed of all things, allowing the squids to destroy more of the ship. 
Hei Chidao sliced off one of the smaller tentacles that came at him before shouting, what the hell is wrong with you? Get back to holding those creatures dammit. Even though she had no way to prove it, Kishina just knew that Naruto was talking bad about her again. Do not talk to me like that. She shouted back to the captain amidst the chaos all around, shout at me like that again, and I will freeze your balls off, got it. Why do I feel like mum's mad at me? Naruto thought with a shiver. He only ever had this feeling when he pulled a prank or he broke something after his mother said not to do that. Oh well, he just hoped he was imagining things. Feeling a small pebble bounce off his head, Naruto rubbed the spot with a scowl as he turned to look at Azula, who was also scowling at him. What was that for? Pause I was talking to you and you completely ignored me. Azula said sharply, her glare intensifying as Naruto gave her a sheepish grin. The two were sitting on a bench in the shade, cooling off from all the running around they had done. Right what were we talking about again? Naruto was lucky looks couldn't kill because if they could, then Azula would have murdered him a dozen times over by now. You asked about my family and I was telling about about my brother, Zuzu, and how he got a knife from our uncle while I got a stupid doll. Azula hated that thing. It was meant for girly girls which she wasn't. Plus the thing was just creepy. As soon as she was alone with it, she burnt it to ash. What terrified her was that, the next morning, it was sitting on a chair in her bedroom staring at her, completely unharmed. No matter what she did, it always returned and was inching closer to her every morning. That was nice of your uncle, Naruto commented, unknowingly breaking Azula away from her terrifying thoughts. Wish I had a brother or sister. What's your brother like? Annoying, Azula quickly said with crossed arms. He tries so hard to be the perfect son, but always makes a fool of himself. While mother dotes on him, father knows that I am better than Zuzu at everything, even firebending. He's barely gifted while I'm naturally gifted. Father even says that I should have been an only child. That's terrible, Naruto said, clearly not happy with what he just heard. He also didn't like the look of pride that Azula wore when she talked about being better than her brother. Parents shouldn't favor one child over another, that's just not right. Especially when your brother is trying to get their approval. He then gave Azula a sharp look that made her flinch, as no one has ever looked at her like that, save for her parents. And it doesn't matter if you're better than him at firebending. If he keeps practicing, then he'll surpass you and everyone else one day. Azula could only stare, not knowing what to say. The way Naruto defended her brother sounded a lot like how her uncle and cousin defend him, saying the same sort of thing. Whatever, she replied, not liking the thought, but knew that it was possible. If he does catch up to me, then good for him, but he's got a lot to learn still. Seeing that his words were getting to Azula, Naruto smiled, I'm sure he'll surprise you eventually. Dear and I, you really do sound like my uncle and cousin, Azula grumbled. I'm sure you'd get along with them swimmingly. Knowing that Azula's family were here, Naruto asked, are your cousin and uncle here too? I know your parents and brother are. Shaking her head, Azula pointing her thumb towards the nearest beach. My cousin, Lu Ten, is with my family right now, probably making sand castles or something with Zuzu. My uncle is still fighting the Earth Kingdom at Ba Sing Si though. That's where he got that knife and doll, after breaking through the city's outer wall. She looked proud again, talking about her uncle achieving the impossible like that, it took over 600 days, but he managed to break into the impenetrable city. Nobody in history had ever managed that. Even though Azula's uncle is part of the Fire Nation, Naruto was impressed by the man's accomplishment. He sounded strong and not someone he should meet. Noticing the sky was starting to turn orange, signaling the coming sunset, Naruto said, didn't realize it was already this time. Need to get something to eat before heading home. I have time before I go back to my family, Azula said, although she was surprised that no one was sent after her already. Come on, there's a stall nearby that serve good food. You can buy me something before I go back. What? Why do I have to buy you stuff? The two children walked off, playfully arguing as they did. Neither seemed to notice three cloaked strangers hiding in an alley and looking in their direction. Are you sure? The tallest one asked, his voice deep and gravely. The second was crouched and nodded his head. Definitely, he answered, that's Princess Azula, and she's all alone. But why is she alone? The third asked, her eyes looked around nervously. Usually people like her have bodyguards or an entire army to protect them. This seems too easy, doesn't it? I haven't seen any guards since she went off on her own, the second man replied, all I know is, this is our chance. What do you think, boss? For a moment, the first man said nothing as he thought things over, still staring after the children in the distance. His eyes scanned the crowds, and he too saw no guards or anyone that was watching out for the princess. This truly was their chance. We keep following them, he ordered, it'll be dark soon. First chance you get, you take her, got it. The two with him nodded, good. While you're gone, I'll get us away off this island. Naruto and Azula walked down the street back towards the beach, both enjoying the treat that Naruto had bought thanks to the money he had procured.
The food they were eating were chicken skewers and meat dumplings, both of which were delicious. This stuff really is good, Naruto said while chewing on a dumpling. There had been a choice of either a meat dumpling or vegetable dumpling, and, of course, he went for the meat. I told you, Azula said in a matter-of-fact tone while nibbling on a bit of chicken. She ate her food at a slow pace compared to Naruto who was scarfing it all down in large bites. It was both impressive and disgusting. The sun was almost finished setting, already darkening the skies, but she knew her family were still at the beach. Her mother and brother liked to watch the sunset, while her father probably went back to their beach house. She didn't know if her cousin would be there or not at this time. She'll find out when she gets there. While walking past a building, a pair of hands suddenly clamped down over her mouth. She shouted in surprise, but it was muffled. Before she could react and use firebending on her attackers, something heavy and made of metal was placed over her hands, while her feet were cuffed. The same happened to Naruto, as he too was cuffed before both were thrown to the ground. That was easy, the cloaked woman commented, taking another look around just to be sure the coast was clear. And you doubted me, the second cloaked man laughed, ignoring the look the woman sent him. He grinned down at the two children, their eyes wide with fear and anger. They tried to shout for help, but their mouths were gagged for good measure. Hello princess, thanks for making this easy for us, being all alone like that. Well, mostly alone, he said, glancing at Naruto who struggled against his bindings. Picking Azula up and the woman said, this plan might actually work. Let's get back to the boss, he'll want the princess in the Earth Kingdom as soon as possible. That shocked Azula, that Earth Kingdom soldiers managed to infiltrate the Fire Nation like this. What about him? We can't have witnesses. For a second, Naruto was scared that these two kidnappers were going to kill him. If he could have, he would have sighed in relief when the cloaked man shook his head, let's just take the boy with us. Even if he's Fire Nation's come, I ain't one for killing kids. Walking over, he picked Naruto up and placed the boy over his shoulder like a sack of potatoes, can't wait to be back home. I'm sure the Fire Nation will do anything to have their little princess back. Now realizing that she was going to be held ransom, Azula struggled even more. Due to her restraints, she couldn't firebend at all as her hands and feet were covered in metal. She couldn't even shout as her mouth was gagged. There was nothing she could do. All she could do was watch as she and Naruto were taken down to the docks. The two kidnappers avoided the guards easily, clearly having learned the routines and such. Making their way to an unassuming boat, they were greeted by another man in a cloak. Good work. Now get her inside before anyone sees, he said, opening the cabin door for the two. He looked at Naruto but made no comment. The cabin was a makeshift prison as Azula and Naruto were thrown to the floor once inside. Have fun, it'll be a while before we reach the Earth Kingdom, the second cloaked man laughed before locking the door, leaving the two alone as the ship began to set sail. So this part ends here. Alright that's it for today's video guys, let me know in the comments section how was the story, and also don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I will meet you in another video, bye bye.